And here we go. Sweet. Uh, I'll start. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, joining us today. My name is Rumit Singh. Uh, I'm a professor of biomechanics at Old Dominion University. Uh, I'm also one of the co-chairs of the ACSM Biomechanics Interest Group, big group as we call it. Um, uh, and this is the group that's hosting the webinar series. We have four co-chairs, uh, myself, Ross Miller, who's also on the call today. Uh, there's two others, uh, Alison Gruber, who's the current uh, head of BIG, and Max Paquette. Um, we recently started a series uh, of webinars where we discuss topics that our memberships might be interested in. We've been doing mostly research highlights, um, interest for people talking about uh, new and upcoming research uh, in biomechanics, motor control, sports medicine. But today we decided to do something a little different uh, from a previous uh, webinars. Uh, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of uh, questions floating around uh, because of the job market. The job market has been interesting to say the least. Uh, and with a lot of questions floating around, it was important to get some answers from people who have followed those career paths, uh, have transitioned to different careers. Um, so we have an excellent group of uh, people here. I'm excited to hear from them. Thank you all for joining. Uh, Ross will give an introduction in a little bit. Uh, but, but the idea of these, these webinar series is to host, uh, well, not just this one, but many more in the future and increase the virtual presence of the community of big in the biomechanics community, motor control community, uh, especially in in the years where we don't really have a, an actual in-person conference. I'm kind of bummed about that, but uh, this is the best we got. And uh, and before I, before I start, uh, I, I also want to take an opportunity to thank our sponsors. Uh, we have them listed on our background, both me and Ross's. Hopefully it, it, it looks... Uh, and I'll hand it over to Ross uh, for introductions. Thanks, Rumit. Um, so we have a, a great panel of uh, four folks here who will be fielding questions for us on uh, career-related questions for, for people with PhDs, grad students, and, and uh, people soon to get PhDs and, and postdocs already with a PhD. Um, these were actually the first four people that I thought of in, in uh, putting this panel together and they all four graciously agreed to, to be on it, which is, is fairly rare in my experience. So that was great. So thanks everyone uh, for your time today. Um, so in alphabetical order here, we have uh, Dr. John DeWitt, who has a PhD in, I believe, exercise science. Is that right, John? Uh, technically, it's in rehabilitation science rehabilitation. from uh, UTMB. And John is currently the senior biomechanist for the Chicago Cubs, for the, the non-American members of the group. That's a professional baseball team in, in the United States. Uh, Dr. Alex Hutchison. Um, Alex, your PhD, I believe, is in biochemistry. Is that correct or something along those lines? Physics, actually, so physics. Way, way out in left field. PhD, PhD in physics. Um, Alex is an author. His uh, recent, the latest book is called Endure. It uh, focuses broadly on the limits to human performance. It's really fantastic. I recommend checking it out if you haven't uh, read it already. And uh, he's also a frequent writer for uh, Outside Magazine. Uh, Dr. Sarah Rolker, uh, her PhD is in mechanical engineering. Is that correct? Some, some, some form of engineering? Yes. Um, that's she's, uh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. That's correct, mechanical. Cool. Um, and she's currently assistant professor in the kinesiology department at University of Massachusetts. And last but not least, this is alphabetical order, uh, my good friend, Dr. Elizabeth Russell Esposito, who I know for sure has a PhD in kinesiology because it's the same degree I have. And she's uh, been in the DOD uh, research system for most of her career and is currently um, a biomedical engineer at the uh, Puget Sound uh, Veterans Administration in Seattle. Okay, um, before we got started on uh, just peppering these folks with career related questions, I wanted to ask you all to just give the, the quick kind of 60 second version of your uh, career path. And if where you're at right now is where you envisioned you would be right now when you were a, a PhD student. So I will start uh, with John. Thanks, Ross and Rumit, and thanks a lot for uh, including me on this. So. So I'll, I'll try to keep it to 60 seconds. I'm really old, so I have lots of experience. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I think some of this stuff might be valuable. So, so bottom line is I got my undergraduate degrees in electrical and computer science engineering from the University of Toledo back in the late 80s. And at that time, I knew I liked engineering, but I didn't, I wanted to be involved with sports. And things like biomechanics and biomechanical, biomechanical engineering, that stuff just didn't exist at the time. So um, I originally was thinking I'd change my major to become an a, a education major so I could work at a high school and coach. 
But my parents um, strongly encouraged me to say, no, finish out your engineering degrees, figure out something that you can get a master's in that's more related along the lines of what you like. So I thought that was going to be physical education because that's what you did at the time. But that's when I was introduced to biomechanics. So this was back in the, the late 80s where, um, you know, the pioneers of the of the area, well, you guys know a lot of these folks already, were making little stick figures of high jumpers and things like that. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is what I'd like to do. So I hunted out um, with the help of an advisor at, at University of Toledo and tried to find a place where I could go and do biomechanics as a, my master's degree and settled on Arizona State. So I went to ASU um, from 1990 through 94. Uh, my mentor was Rick Hendricks. So I worked with Rick and Phil Martin there and Gary Yamaguchi. So those names might sound familiar to you folks. Um, but it, as I was doing my master's degree, I didn't really have an intent to, to be, to go into biomechanics as much as I wanted to be a coach. So I was using the master's degree to get something on my resume so I could get hired as a college coach. I was, I'm really into soccer. So I wanted to coach uh, soccer. And at the time the MLS and professional leagues just didn't exist. So I never, I didn't really even think about going into to, uh, anything other than coaching. But at that time, all we knew was we were probably gonna end up being university professors if we wanted to continue on because there just wasn't a lot of uh, opportunity for biomechanists at the time. And, I remember talking about it would be so cool if we could analyze a baseball pitch or if we could analyze a soccer kick. And the problem is, is that when we come in and analyze this sort of thing, we don't tell anybody what their answer is till about two or three weeks later after we're done manually digitizing video and things like that. So I just thought, well, this, you know, it's, this isn't going to happen now. So fast forward, I went, I coached at the University of New Mexico um, uh, soccer for uh, a few years left there and um, I posted my resume at the time. I don't know if some of you older guys might know this. There was a thing called biomechanics worldwide in frames. That was like a, one of the initial biomechanics websites. It was like biomechel, but someone made it into a website. In, in any case, I posted my resume there. Out of the blue, I got an email. So I'm guessing no one never has this experience but me, but I got an email from the guy who was the lead of the lab at Johnson Space Center saying, hey, we saw your resume and we're looking for a biomechanist and wondering if you're interested. And I thought this is pretty interesting since I really haven't done any biomechanics other than my education work. But of course, I was interested, went, interviewed, got the job, um, came there or stayed there um, for 18 years. So I was a biomechanist at NASA. Um, I see Brent Edwards is on the call. So Brent worked with me there as an intern for a few years. Um, looking at exercise that astronauts do and how that it can be used to reduce bone and muscle loss. Um, one of the things, just a small thing for you guys uh, that I want that you should all know, a little nugget. I asked the, the, the guy who hired me after I got hired, of course, why did you hire me and, or what stood out? And the one thing he said that he liked was on my resume that I put, I, I, had, um, I knew uh, how to use Kane's method or I had uh, experience with Kane's method. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I don't know anything about Kane's method now, but I'm glad that it actually worked because I learned. The bottom line is I was exposed to it from Gary Yamaguchi in my under or in my graduate work, and I did a simulation of a soccer kick. I ended up uh, showing it ASB, so I knew what Kane's method was. But the bottom line, I, don't, I didn't use Kane's method ever in my actual job, but that was what made that's what it stood out on my CV. So when you guys are putting together your CVs and stuff, put that kind of thing on it because you never know if that little buzzword, you know, not necessarily Kane's method, but some, maybe something different, um, you know, neural network or, uh, um, you know, something with open sim, yeah, that might resonate. So anyway, fast, I, I'm getting to the end of my 60 seconds, Ross. Um, I, uh, I stayed at NASA for about 18 years until uh, last year. Um, I, oh, I've been involved with sport though. I've always been involved all the sports. So during the last 10 years, I've also consulted with NBA teams and professional soccer teams and college football teams, things like force plate analysis, a um, lot of uh, data analytics. So not as much biomechanics as much as helping them understanding player loading and those sort of things. Uh, Chicago Cubs reached out and said, hey, we're looking for a biomechanist. We, we collect all this biomechanics data. They have, we have Kinetrack systems and force plates. Um, 
and they wanted someone who could come in and actually put that data to use more than just what's being done now, which is a lot of guys doing machine learning and things like that, looking at it more from the number side. They wanted someone who could actually break it down into things like impulse momentum and stuff like that. So that's that's where I got hired last year in February. It's been a strange year because of COVID. So I think I've been to one baseball game in Mesa last spring, but all my data that I, I work on is up on uh, uh, databases so I can pull those down. And now I'm doing um, I'm doing this on a daily basis. So I, to, to, find, to finish off, if did I envision myself doing what I'm doing now? My goal was yes, but I didn't at the time because it wasn't available. And now it actually is. So sorry for being long-winded there. No problem. It's very interesting. Thanks, John. Uh, Alex, you want to go next? Oh, that, that, was a, that was a pretty cool ride, actually. Um, there, there are some parallels between my path and, and, and John's path, um, even if they're a little abstract. I went to university in the, in the early 90s, and um, I studied physics, not necessarily because I wanted to be a physics, but be, physicist, because, but because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, basically, the advice I got from, from some people at school and, and uh, mentors was like, if you don't know what you want to do, do something really hard because, um, you know, that it, it's easier to move from something hard to, to something else that then you can't go the other way. Uh, I studied physics not, at the end of, and, and I, I guess the parallel to John is that if you had told me that there was a field where people study run, I'm a runner, where people study, you know, the, the, the biomechanics or the physiology or whatever, what have you of running, I would have said that, that sounds awesome. You, you can actually do that for a lifetime. I, I, I would love to do that. I had no idea. I had zero idea that there was such a thing. And, and to some extent, there, there, was, there wasn't such a thing, or at least there was much less of a thing back in the 90s than there is now. There was a much less developed world of sports science. But anyway, so I did physics. Um, at the end of four years, I still had no idea what I wanted to do. So I stuck to the, uh, the advice uh, to just keep doing hard things. So I did a PhD in physics. I did it in England, which is it's just three years. So it wasn't a, as big a, a, an investment of time or, or, or sort of life. As it, as it would have been in North America. Uh, at the end of that three years, I still didn't really want to be a physicist, but didn't know what I wanted to do. At that point, I was lucky enough to be able to move back in with my parents and take a year, a kind of gap year, focus on my running, and just kind of think about what I wanted to, to do and how I wanted to, to my life to play out. I didn't have any sort of immediate epiphanies, but I think that taking some time to think away from the, the pressure ended up really helping me clarify what, what I ended up wanting to do. Anyway, after a year, I, you know, I, living with your parents gets old. And, I, and so I, I, I took a postdoc in physics, uh, a three-year postdoc. And after a couple of years, the thinking I had done during my gap year finally started to pay off. And I started to imagine what could be a cool way of, uh, again, like John was suggesting, finding a way of being involved in sport, which I really wanted to be. And I thought that journalism might be my ticket, that it might be an opportunity to, to write about the stuff that I found interesting. And so I left my postdoc a little bit early after two and a half years and went straight to a, a master's in journalism, a one-year master's. That was a, a bit of a leap because I didn't have any journalism experience. I'd never really worked for a student paper or anything like that. I had tried to apply for a few internships, especially during that gap year, and, and hadn't really made any progress. And so my feeling, the, the question of journalism school for journalists is a, is a big one that's an ongoing debate. What do you really need to study journalism? Um, for me, it was a quite twofold. One was a branding issue. Um, I felt like I needed, if I wanted to make any headway in that world, I needed to show people that that was I was I was not just some guy who thought that he could you know write in his spare time in the evenings. I really wanted to be a journalist. And the second thing was that if I wanted to make it work, I needed to kind of dive into the deep end and and you know know that I needed to make journalism work in order to pay the rent, as opposed to keep sort of traveling along the physics path well in the evenings daydreaming about doing something else. So I, I sort of dove in with both feet, did a one-year master's. And that was, I finished that in 2005. I spent a year and a bit as an intern at a daily newspaper after that, uh, doing general assignment reporting, like car crashes, yada, yada. Um, then went freelance, which is another way of saying I couldn't find a job. So I've been freelance since 2006. And at that point, once I was freelance, I had the freedom to say, well, what is it that I want to do? And what, what, what had I envisioned myself doing? I would love to be, uh, you know, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing? Like, there's only like four people who write columns for Runner's World. Wouldn't it be amazing if I could be one of those people? 
And so I started writing about running and specifically because I had a science background, and this is the part that's maybe a little bit relevant to you guys. I was a very unusual person in the journalism world because I had a scientific training. My scientific training was in, uh, you know, quantum computing, which is not super helpful, but if you have a scientific training, you are completely different from 99% of people in journalism. If you're not afraid of equations, if you're not afraid of talking to scientists. Um, and so I became sort of by default in the, the circles in which I moved the science expert, whether, regardless of whether it was biology or astrophysics or, or, or the science of kinesiology. And so that helped me sort of forge an expertise, which ended up being the science of sport and specifically the science of endurance sport, which is what I'm doing now. So I didn't know, I didn't envision this when I was in high school. Um, by the time I was in university, I sort of thought that would be cool, but I didn't know that I think it would really be possible, but it, it's ended up working out by leveraging that scientific training in ways that I didn't necessarily expect. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sarah, you wanna go next? So I first learned about biomechanics when I was in high school. So kind of almost the opposite of, I learned about this very early on. And so I knew that I wanted to do biomechanics. I just didn't know what it would look like. I was a participant in a research study looking at ACL injuries um, at Cincinnati uh, Children's Hospital and uh, Tim Hewitt's lab. So quite the introduction to biomechanics there. Um, and so I went back for a job shadow day in high school. I did a summer internship there during my bachelor's. I was uh, getting... I think at that time, I still thought I was going to get my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. I switched to biomedical engineering for the rest of my bachelor's, um, but I got involved in research um, my sophomore year, and that was all I wanted to do. I had tried to get a couple of um, internships in industry, but I just, it didn't work out, and I loved doing the research so much that it didn't really matter to me, and so I stayed in research, and then I think it was um, at ASB in 2011 um, was my first uh, academic conference. I was presenting some research there and I looked around and everyone there either had a PhD or was getting a PhD. Um, there weren't very many undergraduates there at the time and I thought, okay, I guess I'm going to graduate school. And I was thinking about this before this call. I was like, I don't really think it was like that big of a decision, which looking back, it is a huge decision to devote that much time of your life to graduate school. But I just was like, okay, this is what I want to do. And so it was kind of at that point, almost just the next logical step in my mind. Um, but I don't think I thought about being a professor until right around that time, probably end of undergrad, early graduate school. But once I got into it, I thought, okay, this is what I want. I want the R1 heavy research um, focus. But I think I thought that more because I hadn't done as much formal teaching. Um, so I, I ended up doing my master's and PhD at Ohio State where I also did my bachelor's, but in mechanical engineering instead of biomedical. Um, and towards the end of my PhD, I knew I wanted to stay in academia still, um, but I felt like I wanted um, a little bit more experience before applying and going on the job market, which is why I chose to do a postdoc. So I went down to the University of Texas and worked with Richard Neptune. Um, I wanted some more clinical experience. So I did some work in stroke. Um, and, and then from there, I, you know, it was a three-year position. I kind of knew that it was tied to his uh, position as chair in the department. And so um, then I had to take the leap to applying to the faculty jobs. And um, that timing just worked out. And I uh, uh, was able to find this great position at UMass. Um, so yes, it, it was, I guess, what I thought I wanted to do when I was in graduate school um, and perhaps maybe sounds a little bit more linear. I can tell you it didn't always feel that way. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's how I ended up here. Thank you. And Elizabeth. I was just trying to figure out how long ago uh, my story starts and I just realized it's 20 years ago. But um, uh, so when I went to undergrad at University of Delaware, I went to the freshman internship or freshman orientation and they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do research in kinesiology to improve human performance and prevent injury. I was ready for what they were going to ask. 
And um, my academic advisor said, well, it sounds like you're going to be a biomechanist. I said, yep, I'm going to be a biomechanist. And it really kind of set the course for my path. Uh, there were only two people in the biomechanics major at University of Delaware. So we had a very unconventional and hands-on experience throughout that. Uh, after I, I did sports in college, I ran track and field. I was a heptathlete, and so I really dabbled in a lot of things, and I feel like that's very analogous to some of my research sometimes, where I feel like I'm dabbling in a lot of different areas. But after undergrad, um, I went to the Olympic Training Center, and I did an internship in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center, and it was a fantastic experience. It's really fun to work with the athletic populations. Before I moved to um, University of Massachusetts and did my master's and my PhD with Joe Hamill in biomechanics and motor control up there. And um, I was only planning on getting a master's, but the economy at that time had different, <laughs> different ideas. And so when the economy kind of really tanked and there weren't a lot of jobs out there, I stuck around for a PhD and I don't regret it one bit since. Uh, so um, thanks for that, Ross. So after that, I wasn't really interested in being in a professor role. I was really, really interested in the research and I wanted to stay the course of research with this human performance and injury prevention. Uh, so I went down to the Andrews Research and Education Institute. Um, Jim Andrews was the chief orthopedic surgeon at the American Sports Medicine Institute and had just opened this bright, shiny research facility down on the beach in Pensacola, Florida. So I went down there and um, ended up running the biomechanics lab down there at the Andrews Research and Education Institute. And it really opened my eyes towards more of the clinical realm, um, sports performance for, for sure, but also all the avenues with clinical research. And from there, we've been doing some projects um, with, with military, and I'd gotten exposed to some of the research going on within the military treatment facilities. And what was going on at the Center for the Intrepid in San Antonio, Texas really interested me. So I moved over there and became a government employee. And uh, so I work with the extremity trauma, the joint DOD VA extremity trauma and amputation center of excellence. Now with the shifting um, military conflicts, a lot of our patients were moving from DOD to VA and I asked the extremity trauma and amputation center of excellence, the East, several years ago, if they would consider me moving me into a VA position up here at the center for limb loss and mobility at the VA Puget Sound. So I've been up here for about the last three and a half years at the Center for Limb Loss and Mobility doing largely amputation-based research um, and lower extremity trauma with prosthetics and orthotics. And so when we do this research, we end up hiring a lot of people with the backgrounds, probably like you all, engineers, kinesiologists, exercise scientists, people with protocol coordination experience, um, kind of really running the full gamut. So there's a lot of careers out there in, in this area for people with your backgrounds. Thanks. Go ahead, Rima. No, I was just gonna thank, thank all of all the all the speakers panelists actually. Um, at this point, uh, we we don't have any uh, structured schedule of questions. We we want to open up the open up the floor for any questions anybody might have for the, for the panelists. Just unmute yourself and say it out loud, or type it up in the chat. Okay. Well, while we wait, um, I, I have a question. We, we collected some of the questions on the registration. So these are not questions from me, but I am certainly interested in them as well. Um, starting with somewhat of a simple but broader question, what, what's the best skills for the industry? Uh, and I understand this might be a little broad based on the industry, but um, if all the panelists could comment a little bit to this. I, I'll start, I'll throw some things out there. Um, one of the things that was drilled into me when I was doing my master's with Rick Hendricks, and, and for those of you guys who know Rick or know of Rick, he's very detail oriented. So he, he kind of instilled in me at that time, I remember this is the early 90s, um, to never trust any software that you buy, that you're better writing your own software. Um, and of course, I don't think that's the same now. I think we're, we're way past that. But the point was, was knowing how to code. So I was not a, 
a slave to whatever the software that was connected to the hardware I had, I could only get that data. Um, and so I know it's a lot different now um, because of uh, a lot of the software that we use is uh, allows a lot of flexibility, but I, but I think one of the a big skill is being able to code and I code and I, I did MATLAB um, excessively at uh, when I was at NASA. Uh, moved away from that uh, to R and Python, mainly because they're free and I can get the same sort of libraries from for those two um, as I did for MATLAB. But but that's one of the things I would say uh, as a biomechanist, you, you need to know not just under, understand, um, you know, Newton, Newtonian physics and things like that, but you also need to be able to manipulate data and and write data. And you don't have to, I don't think you have to be like a, a software ninja, but you certainly should be able, I think, to have coding and not be locked into, well, I made this Excel spreadsheet that if you look in column EZ, you'll see uh, the accelerations of a point that I've just differentiated three times. So that's what I would say is my big thing is being able to code. I'll second John. That's It's like freedom and research. Otherwise, you can only do what other people have already done before. Um, beyond that, writing, for sure, uh, we spend a lot of time writing with grants and papers and such. So, uh, you know, even though I'm not in uh, strictly an academic field, it's kind of analogous to an academic field a, a little bit. And so writing is really, really key in being able to convey the thoughts. The other thing I'm realizing more and more as we move to a lot of these online platforms and sharing things across all different types of media is that... Um, I'm always looking for people that have some graphic design experience or that can put together really, really nice visuals and videos and such. It's an area that I do not have any experience in, so I'm always looking for somebody who does because I just feel like it, um, when you look at these phenomenal presentations and phenomenal articles with great figures, they really stand out a lot more. And I, I think it really helps to share what we're doing in the field and to share kind of the results that we're getting on the research side. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say, obviously, for me as a journalist, the communication skills are, you know, that 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 is the job. So communication is super important. But I, I mean, I really think uh, even if you're in academia, for example, knowledge translation is increasingly important. And certainly if you're in industry, you're, you're not going to be interfacing only with other scientists. And so the ability to explain your work and the importance of your work clearly, whether it's through writing, whether it's you know, it just verbally, like to be able to stop someone in the hallway and explain why, what you need to do or what you're doing and why it's important. Um, that's, a, that's the kind of skill that, I, I mean, I can't think of a context in which good communication skills are not super important, especially the, the farther you get outside academia. And so the, just being able to um, think carefully about who you, the audience you're trying to explain something to and then whatever the medium, what, what it takes to convey this complicated thing that you've done and that has spent maybe have spent years doing i think that's that's super important so i would i would encourage you to take opportunities to to practice that and to try and ex, you know try and explain what you're doing to other people to friends to family and and practice writing and social media i think like just not that everyone has to be on on twitter but man there's a lot of uh interesting scientific discussion these days that goes on on twitter and that that's another form of communication A uh, question in the chat from Tiffany. I'll, I'll let Elizabeth handle this one probably. Where does one find job postings for DOD or VSA, uh, sorry, DOD or VA research positions? A lot are on Biomigal, but that's probably not the answer that you were looking for because you probably already looked there and aren't finding what you're, you want. So um, with, the, with DOD and VA, a lot of the money that we have is grant funded. And so the folks that we end up hiring are on soft money. So if you hear like hard money versus soft money, soft money is like grant funded. It's based on the period of performance of the awards. So um, there are, every, every VA across the country um, has an affiliated nonprofit that works with that VA to kind of route the funding through them. So you can, like for ours in Seattle, it's the Seattle Institute for Biomedical and Clinical Research. They post jobs on, you know, like LinkedIn and Indeed and Glassdoor and Monster and, and such. Um, but also there's, uh, on the DOD side of things, there are only a few agencies that, um, that they use to kind of 
move the funds and that hire all of these researchers for, for DOD research. So for example, a lot of mine are through the Henry Jackson Foundation. So if you look on that website, you'll see just a host of careers for research assistants and research associates, bachelor's level and master's level and PhD level all across the country. Geneva Foundation is another one. Um, Lidos. Um, uh, so, so those are just some to kind of get you, get you started. If I think of the other one that I'm trying to remember, I'll put it in the, the chat before we leave here. But um, there's, I mean, there's tons of research positions all over the country that I really don't feel like always pop up in the, the easy searches that you might be looking for. Uh, another question, Dan. Yeah. That was, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. Uh, another question in, in the chat is, um, How's the hiring process changed in academia and industry over the last few years? And what are your suggestions for trainees getting into the process for the first time? Can I just jump in here again really quick? I would say I've seen the hiring process, not the process necessarily change, um, but when, when we used to post job positions, especially for like master's or PhD level research assistants or associates, we used to get, you know, 10 to 20 applicants, and now we're getting over 100 for almost every single job posting. Um, so the competition out there is so much, it's such, such hard competition. Um, so I would say the one thing that people do that can really set you apart is reach out to the people. Don't rely on... Um, just putting your resume in there and hoping somebody finds it because they're sifting through a hundred resumes. You absolutely have to reach out to the people that you want to work with. Go ahead. I can talk a little bit on the academia side. I, having just applied, I was in 2019, so right before the pandemic, um, I know what I went through and I can tell you that process now. This past year, we haven't hired anyone um, because of the pandemic. And I can tell you that as of right now, I, th I think those positions are gonna be um, fewer. I, I think people are probably had a pause on positions that they wanted to hire in 2020 because of the pandemic. So they weren't able to hire as many people as they wanted to. We are in that situation. There's still some, there's a position available that we want to hire, but we haven't been given the go ahead from the Dean to do that. So it's not that those positions aren't wanted or desired, it's just kind of recovering from the pandemic and when the financial um, backing is going to be there um, for those um, positions. Uh, for me, I, you know, I, I've heard people apply to 90 academic positions in order to get one. I was pretty selective and only applied to about 15. Um, I also felt like where I could go and fit was a little bit more narrow. Um, but I will say that, uh, just like Elizabeth was saying, I made contacts with people. So just like you might wanna do that in industry, um, I talked to the people who hired me at ASB. Um, I knew people uh, at other universities and reached out and asked, you know, do you think I would be a good fit um, even before putting my application in? So kind of being more careful about using my time to apply for jobs that were worthwhile. Um, and then it's a long process. So, you know, for academia, I think the time scale is a lot longer. Those in industry can correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like in industry, people are looking to hire right away. While in academia, you have more forethought to it in some ways where you have to get your application in in September, October, November, and then you've got the phone or Zoom call um, in December, January on campus in January, February, um, and then you're making a decision um, if you get that far. So, um, and it's exhausting. So um, as far as advice for preparing now, I'd say start writing your documents, um, teaching statement, Diversity statements are more commonly looked for these days, no, though they're not universal in your research statement, and get feedback on them from trusted um, advisors or friends. Um, and when you're writing your cover letters, you're writing, um, 
putting in your job applications, make sure you're doing it specific to the institution that you're applying for, showing why you'd fit there specifically and why you'd be successful um, there. I won't say I changed my research statement. What I wanted to do research-wise was gonna be consistent regardless of where I applied. Um, but I applied to, a, even though I felt I was niche, I applied to biomedical, mechanical, kinesiology, physiology departments. Um, so it was just, were they looking for someone who want, had a clinical biomechanics um, interest? So I couldn't apply to every mechanical engineering job, even though that was my background, because they weren't necessarily looking for someone with biomechanics. But I could apply to this kind of wider departments, but you just have to be prepared that they're going to be looking for different things. So my cover letter might have looked different, or my teaching statement might have looked a little different. Um, because of those differences uh, between the universities and what they were looking for. I, th I think that's great advice to make your statements, whatever it is, if it's research or teaching or, or DNI, make it specific to that place that you're applying to. Um, we've hired four or five people since I've been here, and a really generic statement sticks out in a bad way, but a, a, a specific statement also sticks out in a really good way. It's a good way to kind of separate your, separate your application from the rest of the pile of 100 applicants. Especially in the academic world, people do read uh, your cover letters and your CVs before anything else. So make sure your cover letters are specific to the job, to the institution, and what do you want to do? A uh, question from Adrian, I like this one, it says, knowing that biomechanics is still a relatively new research field, where do you see the future of the field going in the next five to 10 years? Anyone want to tackle that one? I'll throw out, I mean, I, I'm not as much, I, I, I defer to my co-panelists on the research side of it, but but what I do think is happening in the next five years is, is uh, there's a huge change in technology and the, the availability of this technology to everyone. Um, I was talking, I don't know if you guys know Steve Swanson, but he's a, a biomechanist who has a company, uh, AccuPower. I was talking to him yesterday and he, he made the comment I thought sounded good. He says, this is like the wild west of biomechanics now because there are so many companies coming out with new products um, that are accessible, you know, and, and some of it's good and some of it's not so good. But um, my, my point being is where I see that the field going in the next 10 years is lots of groups who did not see a value in biomechanical data because they just didn't have access to it will, I think, change. And I think that's going to lead to a lot of opportunity for people who, like us because they're going to need, they're going to get cool gizmos and they're going to need people who can actually come in and tell them if the gizmo is giving them good information and how to actually use the information. So I see us, this, this whole area being changed radically because of the technology boom and things that people are coming up with on a daily basis. We're, we're trying to equip a new like human performance center on campus and, you know, trying to scare up funding for motion capture systems and we, we keep tapping out these budgets for marker based, you know, stick the markers on people motion capture systems. And I'm kind of wondering, like, we're going to buy this thing and it's going to be a dinosaur in a year because everything's everything's going markerless. So I'm just just an example of how the field is, is changing tech wise, I think. From, from completely outside the field, I guess I will say as a journalist, I, I can't count the as you know, as again, as John was saying, I can't count the number of press releases I get from companies with new devices, new, you know, wearable biomechanical monitoring devices. And I don't write about them very much because my first question is, do you have any validation that this is, first of all, that it's measuring what you think it is, which is the sort of step zero. But second of all, if it does measure what you think it does, does it tell us anything useful? And so uh, that's, it sounds to me like that's, that's the question the Chicago Cubs were asking. And that's why they, they, they called in John, like, let's, you know, how, it doesn't matter how many terabytes of data we collect. Is it, changing what we do in any way in meaningful way so i think there's going to be a lot of the, the, the technology boom is already happening but the interpretive boom still the, the hard work of of turning big reams of data into something that actually tells some some someone useful tells people something useful um to me that's hopefully what will happen in the next five years maybe that's wishful thinking that's a great point and and i'll just i want to take on that for one second um i also um 
uh, am an adjunct faculty at University of Houston Clear Lake. So I have exposure to students, but not like most of you guys do. I think it's, it's an impetus to us to teach our students these sort of things that Alex was referring to, to be able to go in, A, use the technology, but B, assess if this technology is actually useful or not. So I think that's something that comes back to us as a community of how we might be informing our students um, to get them to know not just what biomechanics is, but also how to understand and interpret and uh, make decisions based on data. I was just going to add, I think it kind of off Ross, what Ross said too about, you know, I'm kind of trained in that very traditional marker motion capture system, but I, I'm definitely seeing um, already, and I think it will continue to move this way where we want to measure people outside of the lab and the technology is allowing us to do that. It's just which technology do we use, which ones are validated. Um, but I think sort of the ability to get out there um, and do more outside of the lab and then bring the data back in and analyze it is, is going to be the direction I can see a lot of different areas in biomechanics moving in the next five to 10 years. Funding agencies are also um, kind of demanding that to some extent too. They really want to see things outside the lab. Awesome. So next one's about uh, building your brand. Uh, how important is it building your brand through social media platforms and uh, are there preferred platforms for academia versus industry, I guess? Just jump in and say that, uh, I mean, again, I'm not in, in academia or industry, but um, my, my sense from talking to people who are in both of those contexts is that, it, it, yeah, it is important. And, and a lot of us who start out doing PhDs in hard scientists in, in hard sciences are not necessarily interested in self-promotion and, and, you know, tooting our own horns and, and saying, look at my latest research. Um, but to, to one degree or another, uh, there, there are, you know, there are, there are outcomes that depend on disseminating your research. And these days that's done less through less effectively through, you know, publishing in the journal of whatever, or even having your, your university's uh, media relations department type up a press release that nobody's going to read. And a lot more through, you know, interacting and getting out there and, and directly sharing your research. My impression is that Twitter is the most lively place for that among scientists right now. Um, I certainly, these days, compared to even five or even, definitely compared to 10 years ago, I, I, I follow a lot of scientists on Twitter. I see them discussing their work. It's where, I, it's where I find a lot of the studies that I end up writing about. I mean, I still spend a lot of time just combing through tables of contents and reading hundreds of, of titles and dozens of abstracts. But often I just know there's, you know, there's half a dozen scientists in a given field who are curating research, talking about their own research, but also other people's research. And, and it, it just, they do a great job of interpreting this sort of fire hose of information. And so their research gets written about and gets discussed and sets the agenda for subsequent conversations. People know who they are and that, that doesn't hurt when you're, if you're, whether you're trying to get hired, I mean, there was a paper on the Kardashian index, uh, maybe about five, 10 years ago, where it's comparing people's tw number of Twitter followers to their number of citations or to their, to their H index or something like that. You don't necessarily want to be high in the Kardashian index where you're super famous, but you, you've never published anything. Um, but conversely, if, if you're, if you're, even if you're publishing well, if nobody sort of knows about your research, then some of it might get not, not get the recognition it deserves. So I, I guess all of which is to say, I think there, there is value, not in wasting a ton of time, you know, on Instagram or whatever, but in, in engaging with the world, like everyone, I guess, here is doing through the, the biomechanics, biomechanics interest group. I'll, I'll piggyback on this a little bit and ask a question, a related question, maybe certainly for John and possibly for Elizabeth as well. Um, we did a, in our lab meeting, our internal lab meeting at Maryland last semester, did a, a panel on like, we'd have a speaker every week come in and just speak about career advice and a lot of it for uh, for non-academic pathways. One thing that came up over and over again is the the currency of what's valued on resumes for like applying for industry positions is very different than what it is in academic positions um, and specifically on publications and things like that. Um, if you're applying for a job as a faculty position at UMass or at, at Maryland or whatever, 
number of publications, journals they're in, number of times they're cited, things like that is a big deal. You know, 10, 10 publications is probably better than five publications. In industry, I don't get the sense that that's really a big factor. And I, you know, your publications to the extent that they demonstrate domain expertise are, are valuable, but having more and having them necessarily have a lot of citations may not necessarily be that huge of a factor in, in industry. Is that an accurate statement, John, or would you, would you disagree? No, I think it, it's pretty accurate. I mean, I got into my job with the Cubs, uh, had no baseball um, specific publications. So they obviously, that they didn't care about that as much as the capability of knowing that I could do the science that they wanted to do. Now, I know it wouldn't hurt if I would have had some baseball publications. Uh, so, so my point is, is that if you want to get into something like sport, having some publications in that area is not going to hurt you, but I don't think it's going to, it's necess not necessarily a requirement either. Um, so, so I think what they want, they care less about is your publications and more about what areas of expertise that you have. So, you know, I, I made a one pager and really just tried to highlight um, some of the skills that I had that I thought would be appealing to um, the, the hiring group, you know, the, the programming, the uh, understanding how to use uh, machine learning, um, being able to use OpenSIM and Visual 3D, because we use that with some of our data. So that, that sort of practical experience, I think, really outweighed any of the, um, well, I've made 73 publications and a bunch of presentations. I certainly write that at the bottom. I don't want them not to know, but I, they don't need a 10 page list of all the publications in industry. I think as much as they need to know, you're bringing in what they they're looking for as far as the gap they're trying to fill. A uh, question from Mike Bagley, and I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase this a little bit, apologies to Mike. And this is a great question, I think on, on postdocs and the, you know, what to look for in a postdoc. If, you're, if you've identified that you're gonna do a postdoc, which in most cases I would guess probably means you're at least planning on, on going on to an academic career, whether, whether you'll end up there or not, but that's typically something that m most people would do if they're planning on going on to a, a professor position or something like that. Um, is it better for the postdoc to be a deeper dive into your current area and expertise, or is it better to have it be more broader knowledge and uh, new, adding new skills and a little bit outside your area of expertise? I can tell you what I did and I can tell you what I've heard. Um, so I would say mine was a little bit of both. So I did a lot of open sim in my PhD and then I went to a lab that does a lot of simulation. The difference was most of my graduate work had all been just in aging and I really wanted to get into a more clinical population specific neurology. Um, and so I knew that Dr. Neptune did stroke related research. I was actually able to get involved in some Parkinson's related work while I was there too. And so I was able to deepen my skills in OpenSim, which I brought with me and continue to use while also gaining new experiences with new populations. Um, but I think, I have heard kind of both that you can do either. I would say my path was maybe a little bit more on the deep dive side where others might say you just really want to add this new skill. But I think what you need to think about are maybe twofold. Ultimately, it's about what do you want to do, especially if you're going into academia? What's going to set you apart? What do you want to be known for? Is what people would always say when I was applying. What do you want to be known for? What is it that you want to do in the long run? And what are you missing that you need to help get there? Um, and so I want to do really clinically rele relevant research and improve, um, you know, quality of life in individuals as they get older, whether it was just due to aging or due to clinical. And I really I wanted to understand the brain more and the neuro neurology side. So that's why I kind of continue to do a little bit of what I was doing and continue to apply those skills that I had. Um, but apply them in a new way. And so I think trying to decide what is it that I might be missing? Why, why am I doing the postdoc other than two or three years before trying to apply for the, the academic position? What do I want to get out of it? And I think that's going to inform whether it's a deep, deeper dive um, or um, a new skill. I will say, I think I've benefited from going somewhere else to do my deep dive because I got a different perspective from a different advisor. 
I thought about this a lot too, about just what would, if I were going into, if I were finishing my PhD and um, do, if I were doing a postdoc now and I didn't do a postdoc, I went straight into clinical research, but like what would be the most, the most useful skills for me that would help me set me up for either the hiring process or set me up for um, a young investigator. And the business of research is something I don't think a lot of people get exposed to in um, their PhD. I think you get really, really good at doing some repetitive skills that maybe you know how to do. You get really good at computer programming. You get really good at in, um, analyzing data and interpreting data. Um, and it's really great to, to kind of be a scientist, but eventually you might find yourself in almost like less of a scientific role and you kind of get bogged down sometimes with the business of research and how to be a successful researcher, not just how to be a successful scientist and correctly interpret your data and share it with the, the community. So I think that during a postdoc, um, I, I know everyone talks about like learning a new skill. Uh, I think it's really important to get data out of it, data that you can use to kickstart your career. If you're going into um, an academic career, making sure you have data for that first grant to kind of, um, uh, kind of kickstart your lab making sure you understand how to go about the granting process and get as many examples as you can. Collect those examples of, of grants um, from, your, from your colleagues and your mentors at that time, because it's really, really hard to create all those documents from scratch if you're going into the academic world. Um, and then, you know, the postdoc is kind of a time that you can invest in yourself a little bit too, and just thinking through the hiring process, what might be really valuable is leadership courses. I know that's what um, some hiring panels are kind of looking for and that diversity, equity, and inclusion, taking a course, you know, maybe in that so you can show a future hiring panel that, um, you, you know, that, that you've taken steps towards dedication in that area as well. All right, question from James Tracy says, how far in advance of completing a PhD is reasonable to begin reaching out about postdoc or faculty positions that are posted through various means. I think that's tough. So I reached out um, about a year in advance, mm -hmm. um, which Rick was looking for someone a lot sooner, um, but he ended up being willing to wait. Um, not everyone is going to be in that situation because a lot of postdocs are grant based. Mine wasn't. Um, so I, once you know that you're probably about a year out, I would start looking. It doesn't hurt. I responded to a lot of, uh, I won't say a lot. I responded to a few um, postings on Biomech L for postdocs um, and the timelines didn't match up. But I think the sooner you start looking, the more your documents are going to be prepared that when the right one does come up, you'll be ready. Speaking in extremes can be, or absolutes can be risky here, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Um, I don't think, I don't know about the timing necessarily, but I don't think it's ever a bad idea to go on an interview, regardless of what stage you're at, if you think you want to you know, be a, have a faculty position someday. Um, I don't know what Sarah's experience was like, but my, my first interview was nothing like what I thought an academic interview was, was going to be like. It's a very long, uh, hard, and, and stressful day. And just getting that experience, maybe even if you don't give the best interview in the world, sets you up really well for your next interview, just, just having that experience. So I think get, get that experience when you can, even if you think maybe you're a little too early on in the process to have a good shot at it. Agreed. I was told you don't want your dream job to be your first interview. Yeah. You want to have some practice. Um, and I will say the last uh, time I gave my job talk was definitely the best. Um, and it was not at UMass, but thankfully it all worked out. Comment from Brent, it looks like. I wanted to just say a little bit, like just what Sarah and Elizabeth said earlier about what the purpose of the postdoc is. Um, is really good advice. Um, sometimes I get emails though from people that say they wanna to come to my lab to learn the finite element method and they're physical therapists. They wanna learn a new skill and that's how the letter starts out. I wanna to come to your lab to learn something new. And to Elizabeth's point, I, I'm busy with the business of research and I can't teach you how to do the finite element method. <clears throat> so, um, so you have to learn a new skill, but think about a way 
that you can tell the person, you know, when you first reach out, what you can bring to the table that's new. And I think that's how you, you know, that that's how you sort of get your in. If you want to go to a lab that's doing something different, what can you bring them to that lab that they don't have? That's really helpful. Um, and then in terms of Michael's question, when do you start looking? Uh, yeah, a year is great. Like uh, whenever the PhD is eminent, because if somebody reaches out and says, I'm about to graduate in a month or two and I don't have the funding, then that's a problem. But if they reach out 12 months ahead of time and they say, I want to work with you, then I can look for the funding. Um, and so, you know, I would just always encourage people to, to, to reach out as, as soon as you can and, and don't just respond to postings, reach out directly to those people that you are really interested in working with. Thanks, Brent. I think that, that, that sort of speaks to the question from Adam as to thoughts about reaching out to someone that you, have, you, that you wanna work with for the positions uh, that you have very little experience. Uh, especially given the competition out there. So uh, should, should definitely recommend it to reach out to people, but um, any additional thoughts from the panel? Every job I've gotten, well, I've gotten two jobs after grad school, but both my postdoc and my uh, academic position, I, I made contacts with those people outside of the interview process. Um, to let them know I was interested. Um, and, I, and I do think that that was, I don't think it gets you the job, but when your resume ends up being the one that they're looking at on their desk, they've seen your name before. And I think that's helpful. I think the key point is what, what Brent said here is just, don't just emphasize what you want to get from the person you're applying to work with. Em emphasize what you're bringing to them when you join the team. It, it kind of speaks to, to Alex's career story on, and I think it's what makes Alex so good at scientific communication is he's not only a journalist, he's also a scientist or at least someone with very high level training in science. And I think that that brings something to that job that nobody else that I know that's doing that job actually has and is, is a really unique, uh, really, really unique perspective and piece on, on doing that job. So just describe, if you're applying for something like that, describe to whoever's hiring you or making a decision there, what, what are you bringing to it, not just what do you want to get out of it? I think that holds true for regardless of what job you apply to, um, industry or academia. There's, a, there's an interesting one in the chat. Is it feasible to develop a blended career in academia and industry? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, I guess it's, do, sorry. Go ahead. Well, a lot you of people go. do, the, I mean, with startup companies and things like that, you sort of have this, this blended um, career. You know, every time I give a presentation and I have to give my disclosures and I say, you know, I have no disclosures. I'm like, darn, I wish I had a few disclosures. I think I'd really like a few and that would be nice. Um, but a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my colleagues do, and they've been able to make it work. And at universities, there's usually um, um, centers that can help you with kind of getting your, you know, getting uh, those new devices or patents or whatever it may be, kind of getting them to the market. Yeah, what I was going to add was it. I think it depends on what you are, what you mean by academia. Like it's certainly possible if you're working in industry, and if we say industry is a non-university entity, um, then it's certainly possible to be an adjunct faculty somewhere. And because I do that, so then you can stay involved on the academic side. And then also um, to Elizabeth's point, um, depending on if you say you're in the academia side and you want to get an industry, people. Those, you know, there's consulting opportunities all the time. You can start up small businesses. Um, you know, if you worked for a small business and you went to your boss and said, hey, I think we should put an SBIR in for this thing because there's a call and I think we can get some money. 
unless you're overwhelmed with all your work already, my guess is a lot of businesses would say, oh, you can bring money to us? Yeah, sure, do that. So I think it's definitely possible for these things to happen. It just depends on the situation that you're in. The work that I do is kind of a nice blend between the two. So working with the DOD and VA, all VA investigators are affiliate faculty at their local universities. DOD is not quite the same, but you're, you're still in a world where um, everything that's valued in the academic side, uh, maybe not quite as much like teaching and service, but the research side is still really valued here. And so it's kind of this, this blend of both worlds where maybe it's the, I, I kind of think for me, it's the best of both worlds, so to speak, you know, it's, it's not quite industry, but it's not quite academia. It's a little bit of a middle ground. And there's, like I said, there's lots of job opportunities out there if you wanted to kind of just get your feet and wet and try it. The good thing about some of these DOD and VA jobs is we hire right out of grad school where a lot of companies don't. So a lot of people use it to get their one to two years experience before they decide what they want to do next. Okay, we had scheduled this for an hour. I want to be respectful of our, our panel's time. We're already a little bit over here, but uh, any, any last quick questions anyone wants to squeeze in here before we shut things down? Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Maybe. This is for John DeWitt and, and Alex Hutchinson. So uh, I guess the first one's more directly at John. Um, do you find that there are certain dogmas that are developed over the course of a student's PhD or graduate school program that you find you need to break once they start working with you in industry? Uh, and along those same lines, is there something that people are not getting in academics that you wish they were that would help them in industry? That's a tough question because, um, you know, a lot of times people coming in uh, from the academic side over to the industry side, they're coming in and they're really enthusiastic because they're actually getting to apply something that they learned to a, a real problem. So, um, I mean, I, I guess the, o the only thing I would that comes to mind and I'm, you know, ask me this same question in a couple of days after I think about it, I might say something different, but for now it's, it's um, not being, you know, being open to possibilities that may not be the most rigorous from a lab perspective, but still get you the answer that you're looking for from a realistic perspective, you know? So like an example, um, I did an experiment that I published up on the internet. I did it on the International Space Station looking at running on the treadmill. And, uh, and we looked at the ground reaction forces and kinematics and we wanted a motion capture system. And there was a lot of researchers who want to do the same thing. And they're, they're proposing um, very expensive experiments that really the, the cost is transporting the mocap system up to the ISS. And I said, I don't really care. I just want to know how we can keep the astronauts healthy. So the solution I came up with was use a single camera and then we'll do a 2D DLT correction for the perspective error. And I got the answer I wanted. And it got published in the journal of biomechanics. Now, if I did that in a lab, someone would say, oh no, no, this isn't tech enough. We've got to be more accurate. So the point being is that a lot of times in industry, we don't need to have the same precision as the lab. We still want to be precise. And maybe that's the thinking that you have to come out with in the industry wide is, is how can you blend what, what you would do in the lab to what's really feasible in the field to get the answer to the question that you're looking for. Um, because I think in the end in industry, most of the time people, at least in my, the, my experience, they just want to know the answer. They could really care less about the whole cool stuff we do as much as, should I tell this guy to run faster or should I not tell this guy to run faster? So being able to get your head around what the final answer is, and maybe I'll, I'll finalize by saying, knowing when good enough is the enemy of perfect, because I think in the labs, we're, we're really, um, really trained to everything must be perfect. And in real life, it's not always like that, but it's still valuable if we get the answer. 
Thanks. And, and then for Alex, every once in a while, I have a graduate student that is interested in SCICOM. And so for those uh, students, how necessary is it that they go to um, a journalism school um, or get some kind of journalism degree um, versus that they start, I don't know, their own SCICOM blogs? I guess, how would you um, set a graduate student down that path of becoming a SCICOM journalist? Yeah, it's, it's a, so if you ask most people in journalism, they will all insist to you that you don't need to go to journalism school. You can, you can learn from the school of hard knocks. Um, especially if you, especially if you talk to older journalists, you know, they're all like, you know, I didn't go to journalism school. I worked in the coal mines and then, uh, you know, I, someone said, Hey boy, you, you, you can have a chance. And you know, that doesn't happen anymore. And it's still true that there's nothing I learned in journalism school that was essential to my ability to be a science journalist. But the reason I got an internship coming out of journalism school is because I was at journalism school. There's, it's, it's just like the academic thing. There's like, I applied to like a hundred daily newspaper internships coming out of J school and I got one, one job offer. And I was at journalism school at Columbia. You know, it's like maybe the best journal, no, biased, but it was a very good journalism school, had good pedigree, like good, like it's, it's a hard job market. So in a sense, it's a bit of a branding thing. Now, branding aside, you can also go the same way by getting involved, being, you know, do, working with the student newspaper or if you're in, still in grad school or the days of blogs, it's a little tricky. Like the blog is, 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 is kind of out of fashion now. I don't know what it is, like medium now or I don't know, maybe just like Instagram. But yeah, you, you, don't, there, the, you can now just find out whether you enjoy science communication by doing it, whether it's making two minute videos that explain some concept in biomechanics or whatever. Um, and not only does that help you figure out if it's something you like, but it also becomes a calling card to say, hey, look, here's, here's something that I did. I'd like to come and work for, for your organization. So there isn't one right answer. And, and I certainly wouldn't like, you know, I, I did a PhD in a postdoc and it worked out really well for me, but it's not like the optimal career advice is spend a decade of your life uh, learning about quantum computing. Um, but doing it, I think is the best advice trying it, whether that's in the context of a, of a program or whether it's the context of your spare time or maybe even getting your advisor to cut you some slack and give you a half a day a month or something to, or, you know, um, to work on knowledge translation, because that does, I think, redound to the benefit of the lab too, if, if their work is being disseminated. So yeah, there's no runway answer, but, but just do it as kind of the rule number one. Awesome. I, I think uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists and all and everybody who joined in for, for the webinar. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I hope you get, you guys did too. Uh, we'll try to put the recording on a on, on YouTube on a YouTube channel and uh, send it out to, to whoever signed up and also uh, tweet it out so you'll have this for looking up. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining in. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.